behind the textile building, okay? Ease of textile building. Okay, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> so part of, part of the syllabus that we went over said that we would cover engineering ethics in here. And what does engineering ethics have to do with facility design? There's a couple of facilities there on the screen. And if you look at those, what do you see that might be impacted by your ethics? What's that? Okay, there's environmental concerns, public safety, those, uh, those look like roads, I don't see fences keeping people out, so it's open to the public. Uh, contamination, uh, right, yeah, so there's, there's got to be, uh, that's the environmental controls, contamination, we've got to consider that. Well, what's inside those vessels? There's hydrocarbons under pressure. The vessels have to be designed to take that pressure. The connecting piping has to be designed to take that pressure. And then, in fact, if they get over pressure, there has to be relief systems in place that will handle that and discharge it safely and won't let the public be harmed. And who does the public include? Yeah, that's everybody on location. That's your co-workers. That's the people you work with. They don't have to be total strangers. It can be the the, uh, the leasehold pumper that goes by there every day. It can be the compressor mechanic. Those are all part of the general public. Look at the compressor for a minute. What other concerns could we have there? Okay, well that can be all right. What about the noise it makes? What if that compressor is inside the city limits? We've got to consider noise suppression, the effect on the environment just from noise. Uh, emissions that are coming out of that compressor. More and more the oil and gas industry is being held to take account of those types of pollution that may be harder to quantify. You know, I. I just get headaches because there's a compressor next door. And there's a lot of that, and you'll have to contend with that in your, in your role with your companies that you work with. And remember that after hours, the farmers, the ranchers, where our properties are located, are going to be out there. There's going to be hunters. There's going to be any other number of people that are going to have a natural curiosity about what's going on. And so that general public has to be protected with whatever designs that we put in place. There's your East Campus man. <laughs> okay, let me talk about that for a minute. So we're going to talk about ethics, we're going to talk about professionalism, and how it impacts the engineering career. The year was 1937. East Texas had undergone one of the most prolific oil booms that the country had seen. This was early, early discoveries in the East Texas field. The town of New London, <coughs> Texas, had a lot of uh, oil and gas money. They built a new school. That new school had everything the, the public could possibly want <clears throat> excuse me, for their kids. A decision was made to put in a boiler system for heating in the school. Somebody decided that we have all this natural gas, let's just use it instead of putting boiler systems in. We put heaters in all the classrooms. And so to save money, a lot of changes were made. 
those changes were not necessarily engineered. There were no laws on the books regarding what was supposed to happen. So this is a, a newsreel from 1937. It's a little grainy. Let's listen to it. Mine, it's 
1979. I know some of you may not remember that year. But uh, my number was uh, 46,383 that have been registered since 1938. One of our faculty members, Dr. Imani, just uh, recently completed his professional engineering uh, registration. He's number 153,000. So that's roughly 2,800 per year that get professional registration. We usually think of engineers working in the public domain as being civil engineers, for example, on roads and bridges, but it covers all disciplines. And it is discipline specific. So if you look up my name, it says I'm registered as a petroleum engineer. And we all know that's a pretty broad subject but everybody has a specific engineering discipline that they're registered in. Different states have different regulations on how they do that. There is also something in the law called an industrial exemption. Most of you, if you go to work for a corporation, will not necessarily need to be licensed or registered to work in that company and be called an engineer. And the term engineer sometimes, uh, you know, we, we think it gets diluted because you have elevator engineers, you have sanitary engineers. Um, other people in the state have to be licensed. You have to be licensed to be a barber. And so what does our engineering license mean? What does it mean to, for the ethics and the concerns of uh, approaching engineering? So there's an industrial exemption, though. If you're working for a company, you can be called an engineer. And you do not have to have that professional registration. That doesn't mean you don't have to act as a professional. If you work on federal property for the BLM, uh, or not for the BLM, but if the properties you work on are under Bureau of Land Management, or offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, they fall under the BSEE, those, those regulations are becoming tighter and more often will require professional engineering registration to be able to work and sign off on work done on those properties. We're going to be talking about the NSPE, which is the National Society of Professional Engineers. And again, there's lots of words there. But uh, let's take a moment and read the preamble. We'll look at details and parts of it, and again, getting back to where that particularly will impact us. Engineering is an important and learned profession. As members of this profession, engineers are expected to exhibit the highest standards of honesty and integrity. We spend a lot of time talking about honesty and integrity in the classroom. It has to carry forward into the workplace. Engineering has a direct and vital impact on the quality of life for all people. Accordingly, the services provided by engineers require honesty, impartiality, fairness, and equity, and must be dedicated to the protection of the public health, safety, and welfare. So safety is important, health is important, and more and more importantly too, as, as we go, we'll see uh, sustainability incorporated in engineering too. Engineers must perform under a standard of professional behavior that requires adherence to the highest principles of ethical conduct. The questions about cheating carry forward into the workplace. There are professional or fundamental canons or regulations, rules, that uh, actually they're more principles. They don't have to be incorporated into law. But these are principles that we need to follow as engineers. You've seen these before. I know when we talked about ABET accreditation, if you want to be registered as a professional engineer in most states, the university where you got your formal training needs to be accredited, and usually accredited by ABET. And so it's important that Texas Tech be accredited. You know, we pass the test, we're good for six years, we're on our way, it'll be reviewed again. But in performing our, our, our duties, Number one, again, stressed over and over, is the safety, health, and welfare of the public. We uh, perform services only in our areas of competence. I will not sign off on an electrical engineering drawing. I, uh, that's the first thing a 
give up. Where's Kyle? Kyle was my electrical resource for for a project to get it started. But uh, before that project was completed, before any wire was pulled, there was a professional engineer that signed off on the electrical design that was finally that we were putting in place. Issuing public statements only in an objective and truthful manner, you can't be expected to cover up or hide anything when you're involved in an, in an incident or your company's involved in an incident. You're going to speak the whole truth about it. You act for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees. The company that hires you trusts what you do. You owe them that level of honesty and integrity as part of your work. Whether it's a company that's hiring you to work for them or you're on your own. You've hung out your shingle and said, I'm a professional engineer. You owe it to your clients. We'll avoid deceptive acts. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And finally, conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully so as to enhance the honor, reputation, and rep uh, reputation of the profession. There are what's called rules of practice. These look somewhat similar, but again, with a little more detail. These are all found on the uh, National uh, Society of Professional Engineers webpage, the reference given on the slides. But again, the rules of practice sound like the first canon. Engineers hold paramount to safety, health, and welfare of the public. And so engineers perform services only in their areas of competence. What do you sign off on? On what? Petroleum engineering. On the petroleum engineering side. The law also, though, says you can sign off on areas of your education or experience. I uh, have a membership in the National Society of Mechanical Engineers. I don't hold myself out to be a mechanical engineer, but a lot of the work I've done in the course of my career, I've encountered a lot of mechanical engineering, and in some cases a lot more so than petroleum engineering. And so in some areas that I feel uh, that I know enough about that I would hold myself out as an expert or as knowledgeable of that particular field, even according to the law of being registered as a petroleum engineer, I could do that. If I was well versed in electronics or automation controls, I could say, I'd, you know, all right, on that component of electrical engineering, I would sign off on. If it's the power distribution system bringing the, the power in there, I know enough that I don't know anything about it. So I've got to have somebody else sign off on that. But still, as a project manager, you can sign that off, sign off on that. Uh, these are some of the other things that we've read. So let's talk about some situations that come up in the workplace. You're building a facility, and in, in the process of doing that facility, remember the first picture had showed lots and lots of equipment that's out there. You're going to have a number of vendor-operator relationships. Some of you, when you go to work, will work as a vendor. You're going to be coming back around and selling things to your buddies. And in turn, you're going to be buying things from your buddies. So, you're the vendor, you call the operator, you're going to talk about a particular project, about designing some equipment, you need specs, yeah, let's meet for coffee. Vendor buys coffee, fine. You haven't been unduly influenced, right? Well, let's, uh, I'll take you out for lunch. Is that right to go with vendor for lunch? shake your head yes, and by the way, you need to check your company policy, what that says too. There may be limits on the amount that, they, that can be spent. There uh, may be a prohibition against it for whatever reason. I know uh, one company that I visited, a large major oil company, vendor had brought donuts that morning to the uh, break area. For an employee of that operator to get one of those donuts, they had to sign a sheet that they took one. Now that was about the most extreme I've seen. So it might be all right to take a meal. What about if I'm working on that project and the, the vendor says to me, you know, uh, 
we've got a good deal with the steakhouse down here. They will, we can let you have a package of steaks to take home. Put them in your freezer. That all right? Why? What's a package of steaks cost? You know, maybe it's hundred bucks. Are we conducting any business? What is, what is the vendor trying to do? Yeah, it's a, it's a form of persuasion. Uh, that happened to me. Early on in my career, I was uh, looking at uh, pumps for uh, sucker rod pumps. And we had a, a field with about 300. We had corrosion problems, and so we were going back to our two major vendors and, and looking at the pumps they had for sale. And, and literally, after I was visiting pump shops to see how they were torn apart, what, what they broke down, what was wrong with them. And uh, as I visited one pump shop, they said, why don't you just swing by a so-and-so butcher shop and just pick you up some steaks, you know. And, and right then, we hadn't had any ethics training to, to a great extent. But just in my own mind, I had to say, no, I'll go out to lunch with you, but I'm not going to do that. The next time a vendor came up and he said, we we're working in Hobbs, New Mexico. He said, we got the company plane in town. We'd like to fly to El Paso tonight, have some dinner down there, come back, you know, bring back later tonight. You and your wife, we're just going to dinner. But we're flying to El Paso to do it. Would you take that? What's wrong with that? Anything? Raise your hand if you take that deal. <laughs> the vegetarian wouldn't take it, okay. So it, 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 it's going beyond just something that I could eat at one, one sitting or one meal. Okay, you're all good Texas Tech sports fans, you're out working, and now the guy's got tickets to the Tech Texas game. Sweets. You want to go to the game? Yeah, company policy comes into play here a lot. What is ethical, what isn't? And there may be policy prohibitions on taking tickets to sporting events. And let me tell you, it's a trap young engineers really fall into when they think, this is my friend that's taking me to lunch, it's taking me to the ball game, it's taking my wife and I to a theater or plays. And as that association grows, it's having more and more influence on you like, well, you know, maybe we give them a little extra help on this on this bid or something. And so it's, it's, it just creeps up on you. You've got to, to watch it, know where, know where your boundaries are. And that's what all of these rules of practice, all these things about ethics are talking about. So we're buying pipelines to connect all of this equipment together. Company policy says I have to have a one and a half, 1.5 safety factor on that pipe. But if I can get by with a 1.4 safety factor, I can buy a lesser grade of pipe and I can save a lot of money. Should I do that? It's only a tenth difference. And it'll save a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Would you do that? Why not? <laughs> it's there for a reason. It's a company policy, though, right? What dictates company policy? Experience, management. Is it something you could talk to your boss about? Is it something you think you ought to tell them about that you're on the margin? Have you violated any ethics by doing this? How many of you remember the Challenger? The space shuttle that blew up. What went wrong with it? Do what? 
with some O-rings that blew out that the engineers had brought up to management and said, you know, we don't think maybe we should use these. There's, there's danger at the temperatures that are running. And there was management involved and said, no, we'll be all right. And so the management took that risk, not the engineer. The engineer spoke up. The engineer should have spoken up. But the management overrode it. So company policies are dictated by management. You've got to bring engineering expertise in there and say, this is all right. I, I can recommend this without any fear. This pipeline may go through an area that, you know, the worst thing that's going to get hurt is a jackrabbit. What if that pipe goes through a, a DOT, Department of Transportation, regulated area, and it says for the population density that I have to derate the pipe 12.5%, but if I only derate it 10%, I can save a lot of money. Would you take that one to the boss and recommend it? Why not? It's just a little bit of difference. It's saving a lot of money again. Remember, it's a Department of Transportation regulation. It's not a company policy. So it has the effect of law. So our ethics may say, our engineering calculations say, you know, it makes a slight difference. It saves a lot of money. But there's a law I have to follow. And I don't, I don't even think I want to broach the subject on this one. And there's a difference between that company policy and that law that I must follow. Okay, there's uh, also part of the NSPE code are professional obligations. They look very similar to some things we've already talked about. There's a lot of verbiage here. There's about eight or nine of these. They're all on their webpage. But it says that you're not going to criticize or uh, untruthfully criticize other engineers or other improper or questionable methods by uh, trying to bring them down to other folks by down, down playing against them. You may find yourself in a court case against one of your classmates. You work for two different companies, there's a difference of whatever has happened. Your professional ethic, professional ethics won't let you go in there and say, you know, I knew him in college. He was a goof off then. I wouldn't trust anything he did. So you're to conduct yourself in a professional manner. You may tell that to your lawyer. And they'll tell you how to couch those words. But publicly, we don't do that. Um, this, this segment on here is about a duty to report. So what's the, would you report cheating? And if we see unethical practices, we need to report those to the proper authorities. That third one uh, just uh, talks about accepting personal responsibility. If you made a mistake, admit it. And then let's fix it. Uh, the last one on this page is about giving credit for engineering work to those who deserve credit. We've, we've talked over and over in your college career about plagiarism. That's somebody else's work, somebody else's writing. Uh, if we use it, we give it proper credit. It carries right on into the workplace and to professional ethics. says engineers and more obligation to be guided in all relations by standards of honesty and integrity. Um, you should give honest advice. Even if it means you're going to cancel the project, you're going to kill the project. That's your obligation as an engineer. Uh, case in point of working in California heavy crude oil project that sent me out there to automate this project. All those separators and treaters were in a heavy oil field where the gravity of the oil and the water were so close together sometimes they would flip. And the oil would go on bottom and the water would go on top. I looked at that for a number of reasons. One of them also being that the price of oil was dropping pretty severely at the time. I said, you know, we just can't afford to automate this. We can't do it. So the right thing to do was stand up and tell management that. And I did that at a meeting. And the results weren't too bad. 
they sent me to Dubai for two years. <laughs> <laughs> but it's better than saying, oh yes sir, that engineer that kind of did the preliminary study, he did just fine and I think we ought to go ahead and implement this and spend these hundreds of thousands of dollars on something that's not going to work. So it's your duty to speak up and say the right thing when it's time to say it. Uh, we need to, in, engineers shall at all times strive to serve the public interest and they can go just beyond engineering design. You need to be active in your community and be a part of the community and your good ideas can be carried forth there too. Um, talk about avoiding conduct or practice that deceives the public, let's be honest. Engineers shall not disclose without consent confidential information concerning the business affairs or technical processes of a former client or employer or public body in which they serve. I retired from a company two years ago. One of the stipulations of that was that I held information uh, that was proprietary to that company, I held it confidential. And there's legal action that can be taken if I don't. I know you, all of you in here are 4222 and one of the project is Eagleford. I know more about the Eagleford than I can tell you. And so, without getting a release of that information and saying, can we publicly talk about this, I'm bound by that agreement that I have with that company not to disclose that information. So it's not only a professional ethic, that one in case is, is uh, backed by law. How many of you worked an internship? Did you see proprietary company information? Did they say anything about who you could talk to about? Danny, you're shaking your head yes? Under threat of death or something like that? <laughs> you have to hold things company confidential. There's things that have to be held company confidential until such time as they're made available to the general public, especially as it may affect stock price, as it may affect uh, uh, future activities of the company, you could let something out that could cost a lot of money. And so all of these things are applying to our, our ethics here. Uh, the last one on professional obligations is engineers shall not be influenced in their professional duties by conflicting interest. The company I was with had bought another company. The other company had an engineer on the payroll that they were wanting to let go. They held off until the merger was completed, and then they said, you're the new owner, you take care of this. And so I was the vice president over that division. The engineer that had worked for them bought interest in a saltwater disposal well that didn't belong to the company. And he was over here on the side, and all the water trucks hauling saltwater away from the company's properties were going right to that disposal well. And so he was profiting from that. So it's a pretty easy decision on the company to make. You know, the guy's got an obvious conflict of interest. Didn't disclose it, didn't say anything to anybody about it. So one of the first things we did was brought him in and fired him. And so help me, as I looked at him right across the table, I said, you're fired. The next thing he looked up and said, can I work as a consultant? <laughs> no way. So the guy wasn't very bright. But you've got to avoid those conflicts of interest, however subtle they might be. So out of all of this, there's about three takeaways. One is you have the responsibility to protect the safety and health of the public in the design and operation of a facility. Whether you're licensed or not, whether you've got that certificate that says I'm registered or licensed, this is still your obligation. The public, remember, includes everybody you work with, everybody that might potentially come in contact with what you're designing and setting out there. And then thirdly, know your limits of your area of expertise. You're getting a good education here. You'll get a lot more experience to go with it. And that's what you'll have as your area of expertise that you can sign off on and know what your limits are when you need to go talk to somebody else and bring them into that picture to, for engineering design. Questions?
Who is Tamsan? Thank you for coming. For those who come there, please come to see me. All right? Okay. See you next uh, Tuesday. And for those who didn't attend, watch the video on YouTube with a summary of 800 words. Bye-bye.